Neural nets are a powerful framework for machine learning, and they're now accessible for Mathematica. So their recent popularity has come from a combination of things, whether it's from new techniques, uh, the expansion in the amount of available training data, cheaper and faster processes, particularly GPUs. They're already used in production by large companies and for computer vision, speech to text, ranking, and various other tasks. The new neural network framework Mathematica 11 provides a construction kit for training your own networks. So the things I'm going to cover are how inputs to a net are encoded as tensors, what layers operate on those tensors, how to compose layers, what training data looks like, how networks learn, very roughly, the kinds of supervised learning that you can do, loss functions, and a worked example of training in practice. So neural networks operate on numeric tensors, which are basically arrays of numbers. Different ranks of tensor are used depending on the application. So most common are vectors and matrices, but let's look at some examples. Here's some simple examples of tensors and what kinds of data they can be used to represent. Vectors can be used to represent points or encodings of discrete classes. So you can see these points correspond to these two vectors. And these classes, A, B, and C, example labels of classes, correspond to these one-hot encoded vectors. Uh, matrices can re represent grayscale images. And then three tensors, the sort of generalization of matrices, could be, uh, could be used to represent images with multiple color channels, so red, green, and blue in this case. So to get data like an image into a network, we have to encode it as a tensor. Mathematica makes this easy with net encoders. So here we have an example of encoding a grayscale image here into a tensor. And another example of encoding a class consisting of the labels dog, cat, and frog. These get encoded as unit vectors in which exactly one vector component is 1 and the others are 0. The net decoder does the opposite. It's used on the output of a net and it takes a, a tensor and converts it back into something like an image or a class. Layers are the building blocks of a network. Most layers take a single input tensor and produce an output tensor. Crucially, some layers contain parameters that are modified during training in order to specialize the network to a given task. And layers can be composed, as we'll see later. So let's look at some examples of layers. Dot plus layers, also called fully, I'm going to zoom in quickly. So dot plus layers, also called fully connected layers in the literature, are a very common type of layer. They contain a weight matrix and a bias vector. And they effectively perform an affine transformation of the input vector to produce an output vector. So here's a sort of visual representation of that. The weight and bias parameters are learned during training. So next up is an element-wise layer. It's a simpler kind of layer that is often applied after a dot plus layer. It applies a nonlinearity to each element of the input tensor. So element-wise layers have no learned parameters, but you can specify which nonlinearity to apply. And here, three. A convolution layer is an image-oriented layer. Convolution layers were the key innovation that made neural networks successful at computer vision. It involves a set of kernels. It convolves a set of kernels against the input tensor, which is a three tensor. So I'm just showing one channel of the input image, and you're convolving it with this kernel to produce each pixel of the output image. These kernels are learned during training. It is possible to visualize these kernels. Interestingly, some convolution networks learn kernels that are reminiscent of the responses of neurons in the human visual cortex. So here's some examples from a particularly deep network. The simplest way to build a net is to chain together several layers so that the output of each layer is used as the input of the next. NetChain lets you express this pattern. Once you've built a NetChain, you can probe the individual layers interactively. Here's a simple example of a NetChain in action. It contains a dot plus layer, a nonlinearity, and another dot plus layer. The, the final output is a vector of size 1, which we decode as a single scalar value. Here, we've plotted the behavior of this net when the weights are chosen randomly. 
Because they are so common, we can write dot plus and nonlinear activation layers with a kind of syntax sugar, which you can see here. For more complex tasks, we can use NetGraph, which lets you connect up layers in more complex ways. Here I'm showing a fairly complex object recognition model called Inception. This contains dozens of layers, but most graphs are much simpler than this. This is the kind of extreme case. Here I'm going to show a very simple graph that we'll we will use to perform a common operation at the start of the net then branch off from there to make two separate outputs. And here. Notice that I've used netport construct to name the two outputs individually. Here I'm randomly initializing this net because it contains some parameters. And we can apply it to an input to see the outputs of those, those two ports. Here I'm visualizing what those outputs do as a function of the input. Training a network is the process of showing the net lots of input-output examples and tuning the learned parameters the net approximates the correct output when given a particular input. More precisely, this is known as supervised learning. We call the set of examples the training data, which you will need to provide as the second argument to NetTrain. I'll show that later. We don't have much time, so I'm not going to cover the phenomenon of overfitting, which is the name for when a net effectively memorizes input-output pairs instead of learning to generalize beyond the training data. It's the sort of AI equivalent of teaching to the test. With Mathematica 11, we provide a few well-known data sets to experiment with. You can get access to these using the function resource data, which is also new in 11. First that I'm showing here is MNIST, a database of handwritten digits. The most common task is to predict the digit just given the image. The second is CIFAR 10, a set of small images showing objects in one of 10 categories. So here are just four samples at random. The third is a related data set called CIFAR 100, a set of small images showing objects, sorry, it has two labels for each image. Learning both labels at once is called multitask learning. You can find examples using all of these data sets in the marketing pages and the documentation of NetTrain under applications. One kind of supervised learning is known as regression. In this task, the net's job is to predict the numeric value or tensor values from the input. For small data sets, it's often better to use the existing predict function. However, neural networks can be useful in some niche applications where you have some prior knowledge of the functions that will best approximate your data, or if you want to use more exotic techniques like autoencoders. Classification involves trying to predict a class variable, which is an output that takes one of a discrete set of values. For object recognition, for example, the classes could be strings like dog, cat, and so on. To do this, you will need to use the softmax layer to produce a vector of probabilities using input from some other stage of your net. Softmax performs a kind of normalizing operation, as you can see here. As I vary the inputs to the softmax layer, it kind of normalizes them into probabilities that all sum up to one. Once your net has produced a probability vector, it's useful to use a net decoder to interpret those probabilities. Here's a decoder that interprets a vector of length 3 as the probabilities of the classes dog, cat, and frog. Decoders can be attached to, show, to the output of a net and by default give the most likely class. So here, because it's the first class, dog is the most likely class. And then here, it's the second one that's highest, so it's cat. But if we use a second argument to the decoder, we can access other useful properties, like the entropy of a particular prediction, or the top n classes and their probabilities, or the probability of a specific class, like frog here. So like an encoder, a decoder can be attached to the output of a net directly. I'll show that later. Before we can train a net, we have to define how to measure the performance of a net. That's the job of loss functions. Loss functions take the prediction from the net, as well as the true value from the training data, and produce a loss, which is a measure of the error of the net. As you can see, the loss decreases during training. Typically, it goes down quickly and then starts to plateau as the parameters of the net converge on their final values. 
Loss functions are layers like any other layer. Unlike most layers, though, they take two inputs, one from the net and one from the training data, and they produce a scalar value, the loss. The right loss to use depends on the application, but luckily NetTrain will pick a loss function for you based on the output of the net. You can still specify a loss using the third argument of NetTrain or by embedding your loss directly in your network. Let's look at an example. For regression problems, you'll usually want to use mean squared loss. But here I'll illustrate mean absolute loss because it is easier to visualize. They're fairly similar. Mean absolute loss measures the average distance between the output of the net and the true value. This example shows the input and target. So there's the input and there's the target. And the output is the average distance between them, as you can see. For classification problems, the situation is slightly more complex. The net produces a distribution in the form of a probability vector. Here, the loss you'll want to use is known as cross-entropy loss. The technical definition involves the average amount of extra information you need to specify the true class, given the prediction of the network. But this basic example shows the idea. Here we have the input of probability vectors, and here we have the correct class. So that's just an index, one, two, or three. When the prediction assigns a high probability to the correct class, in this case the first class, then the loss is low. But if we say that the second class is actually the correct class, then we get a much higher loss because the network predicted the, the wrong class. As you can tell from these examples, minimizing the loss corresponds to finding weights for the net that cause it to predict the output as well as possible. So when training a network, that's really what, what's really happening is an optimization process. The training data is split into small batches, typically a few dozen examples are in each. Each batch, the net, net train will then compute the error of the network in reproducing the true output, and from that calculate a small change to make to the learned parameters that will make the network perform a bit better. By applying these changes again and again, the net converges on good values of these parameters. This is called gradient descent. We often talk of rounds, which are also known as epochs. A round is one entire traversal of the training data. Depending on how much training data you have, a round can take milliseconds or hours. OK, so let's uh, do a, an example that pulls everything together. This example shows a simple convolutional net being trained to recognize objects in the CIFAR 10 dataset. First, we obtain the, obtain the training data using the resource data function. Then, we create a decoder to interpret the output of the net as the probabilities of each of the 10 classes. Here are the 10 classes, and here's the decoder. Then, we'll create an encoder to take the images and turn them into three tenses. Here's the encoder. Then, we'll set up the network. We'll use two stacks, each containing a convolution, a nonlinearity, and a pooling layer. At that point, we'll have a smaller tensor. As you can see, we started off with a 3 by 32 by 32 3 tensor. And then after all these convolutions and poolings, we end up with a much smaller 50 by 5 by 5 tensor. So the spatial dimension is reduced, but the number of channels is much higher. These are sort of abstract feature channels. We'll flatten that tensor into a vector with a flattened layer, effectively throwing away the spatial information. And from that, we'll use a two-layer perceptron and a softmax layer to produce the final probabilities. Now we're ready to train. I don't want to do this here because it takes about seven minutes on my laptop, which doesn't have an NVIDIA GPU. Now that we have a trained network, here's the training process, kind of screenshotted for you. We can use it to classify a set of images. So here I'm feeding in uh, five images, and I'm getting the five most likely classes for each one. As you'll notice, nets thread automatically over inputs. This is quite a lot more efficient than mapping the net over this list. And lastly, we'll uh, use a property of the, of the final decoder to obtain something more interesting for a particular image. Not the most likely class, but the probabilities of the top three classes. So in this case, it did a terrible job. It thought that ostrich was either a truck, a dog, or a deer. So I'll show one more thing, which is once you've trained a net, you might want to make all, uh, all kinds of measurements of how well it, it performs. 
So for that, you use the classifier measurements function. This is a general function that's used on the output of classifier, but it can also be used on nets. And here, we're feeding it test data that uh, the net wasn't exposed to during training. So it's a kind of fair comparison. It's not just memorizing the, the inputs. You can see that the accuracy isn't particularly high. This is quite a simple net, but it's possible to get accuracy much higher than this. So 65% of the examples were classified correctly. We can get a confusion matrix plot that lets us understand which classes are typically confused with other classes. So the diagonal along this matrix tells you all the correct classifications, and then off diagonal things are misclassifications. And lastly, we can find particular misclassifications that we might find you know, um, help, helpful to our intuition. So here's an example of all the trucks that are misclassified as dogs. OK, so that's roughly a kind of whirlwind tour of the new net functionality. I'll try to give a very brief introduction to the basic theory of how they work. And I've shown examples of, of what they look like in Mathematica 11. Here's a brief list of some of the things we're planning for subsequent versions. I can't promise that any particular feature will make it into 11.1, .1, but we're working hard on these. By far the most important feature here is support for recurrent nets, which will allow you to create nets that operate on sequential data like text, time series, and audio. But there are other valuable features here, like multi-GP training. All right, that's the end of my uh, portion. So um, first I'll take questions, and I guess we'll go to a general um, chat session.